So why don't we get started. Uh, for the purposes of full disclosure, the original abstract that I wrote was very prescriptive. So instead of uh, outlining an exact implementation, I realized there's many uh, over time. And instead of doing that, I chose to come up with a series of steps at the end on how to bridge the gap. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? Um, today, I plan on talking about a brief history of cluster management. Uh, the reason behind that is to give an overview of where some of the technologies come from, where their gaps might be, uh, and where they can integrate and learn from the past too as well. Uh, do a brief overview of some of the concepts of Kubernetes that you'll need to know in order for you to bridge the gap across your frameworks. Uh, talk about Mesos and the modern data center, how Kubernetes fits in that whole space. Uh, and finally, talking about crossing the streams of how to leverage uh, Kubernetes services from Mesos frameworks and talk about some interesting things you might want to pay attention to when you're trying to work back and forth across both. So a brief history of cluster management. The good ideas of today often mimic the good ideas of the past. Um, and you can also learn from history too, otherwise you're destined to repeat it. Right? So it, it wouldn't be my talk without paying homage to uh, back to, <coughs> uh, to Ghostbusters. So uh, before we get into the history of behind some of this, you know, let's take you back to the late 80s, the early 90s, okay? So before there was the term container orchestration, uh, before there was infrastructure as a service, there was the grid, right? Uh, and here, a quote from a, a, a good article is, in the 1990s, inspired by the availability of high-speed wide area networks and challenged by computational requirements of new applications, researchers began to imagine computing infrastructure that would provide access to computing on demand, right? or COD as we used to like to call it, and permit flexible, secure, coordinated resource sharing among dynamic collections of individuals, institutions, and resources. This was published in the 90s, and it sounds a lot like today, right? So what were the drivers of the grid? Um, well, large-scale scientific computing were one of the primary drivers, right? So nowadays, the LHC is a primary driver of the grid, uh, the Large Hadron Collider. There's a, a great post I recommend if you're interested in getting an overview of some of the things they do uh, to get an idea of the scale that they work at. Um, you can go to their website and they'll, they'll have a whole section on what they use for their grid infrastructure. Uh, but the primary uh, concept is the desire to have federated computing at hundreds of sites in order to analyze petabytes of data. Sounds like big data, right? Because it is big data. Uh, the primary goal or driver, though, is throughput, right? They're not necessarily caring about services. Uh, they support a lot of pleasingly parallel algorithms, and there's lots of enormous workflows or DAGs. Another driver is it's analogous to utilities <coughs> of the time, but for on demand compute power. You basically want to be charged for what you use, right? That's very analogous to what people are doing nowadays, right? Uh, there's heterogeneous distributed resource management infrastructures, which are multi-tenant, have independent security models, and there are many, many different cluster management systems that are all working together, kind of like what we're seeing today, right? So you'll find that the ideas of the past are starting to mirror the same ideas that we have right now. So we had Globus, Hadoop, Condor, SGA, LSF, PBS, S, you know, all kind of working in concert with one another. Uh, one thing that we had in the past, which we don't necessarily have today, is sophisticated matchmaking due to the heterogeneous nature of the grid. And I'll go into that in just a second. So take a moment and, and try to look back and understand what are the basic operations that the grid provides or does. One, provision resources. Two, publish and advertise resource availability. Three, assemble resources into an operational grid or pool. Uh, four, consume resources across a variety of applications. That sounds like everything that Mesos kind of does, and Kubernetes for that matter, right? So if I were to distill those two technologies down, this is the operational model that they both subscribe to, right? So what are some of the lessons learned, right? We have all these systems that we've created over time, right? What are some of the lessons that we can learn? Well, one is not everything is a job, and we're seeing that nowadays with the creation of multiple sophisticated schedulers, right? Some of these schedulers provide high availability for microservices, right? So that's 
one key thing to, to learn from. But one lesson I don't think we have necessarily learned for, from is the need for more composability. As I just mentioned, there are these four main sex, sections that always repeat themselves over time. Provisioning resources, publisher advertised resource availability, assemble resources into operational greater pool, and consume resources across a variety of applications. So we, we've kind of aligned around Docker, a lot, or the ecosystem kind of has for containers, right? But what's the next layer above that in order for you to do a lots of interesting, sophisticated scheduling models, right? Now, Mesos provides an abstraction layer which is above that, but what if you could have the control of slicing an individual machine up, right? You have that layer of abstraction through Mesos, but what if you just wanted that low primitive layer? The, what, what seems to be missing across all of these different orchestration systems is that you don't have the unit of a machine. Right? Not across every single type of orchestration system. Uh, <clears throat> some of the other lessons learned is that heterogeneous, heterogeneous computing platforms is really, really hard. Right? It, back in the day, there was a lot of hardware diversity. There was Sun x86, Titanium, PowerPC, and there was assorted hardware specializations that existed. Right? There was also OS diversity. We had to deal with Solaris, Windows, Linux, HBox, AIX. And there was also the installed stack diversity that existed there too as well, right? So what do we learn from all that? Well, matching hardware plus operating system plus software stack can be a grizzly bear. Uh, containers solves some of this problem, not all of this problem. There's a, a great aphorism that a colleague of mine created which says, uh, software people often say we eliminated a whole class of problems when they mean we chose trade-offs that make you solve them elsewhere, right? Which is one of those truisms that exist inside computing. Uh, another thing we've learned over time is flat L3 networking can be difficult, right? So you're gonna have to manage your ports. Port mangling can be hard, then you have to deal with sort of quality of service if you care about it. Uh, NATing should be configurable. Uh, a lot of old systems relied heavily on reverse DNS, uh, and you want to be able to have that ability to NAT. Right? There needs to be more flexibility, the ability to create your own scheduler. And that's kind of the, the key need that was born, that create, helped to create Mesos, right? Uh, one lesson that hasn't necessarily been learned yet uh, across all of these systems is that expressiveness can be good, right? When managed, otherwise it can be obtuse. So a lot of older systems had very expressive matching semantics and uh, sort of configuration languages, right? And those configuration languages allow you to do very sophisticated types of policies, right? If you wanted to be able to rank and order things, if you wanted to be able to set up your own preemption policies, those flexibilities and capabilities existed in other systems. So let's fast forward to 2015, right? Let's take a look at what is Kubernetes. Uh, the Greek word Kubernetes means helmsman of a ship, or metaphorically a ruler, right? Actually, if you go through the whole derivation of the meaning of the, the word, you know, nowadays it actually references governor, right? Which is kind of funny. So let's define what, it, what Kubernetes is, right? Kubernetes is an open source orchestration system for containers. So containers only, right? It handles scheduling onto nodes to, in a compute cluster and actively manages workloads to ensure their state and matches, that the, <clears throat> matches the user's declared intentions. Right? I don't know about you, but I love densely packed statements like this because it kind of makes me wonder what it really actually means. Right? So uh, let's break it down a little bit. Um, it manages containerized applications across multiple hosts, providing basic mechanisms for deployment maintenance and scaling of applications. Its APIs are intended to serve as the foundation layer of an open ecosystem of tools, automation systems, and higher level APIs. Okay, well, kind of makes sense. Uh, it establishes a set of robust declarative primitives for maintaining desired state requested by the user. These primitives are the main value add. And Kubernetes is, a, is an open source derivative work based on Google's internal Borg infrastructure. So a lot of the main developers that are working on the internal Borg infrastructure are also working on Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is declarative. 
Uh, so here's a very simple example. Uh, you basically specify the number of replicas that you'd like in a replication controller, and when you submit that, Kubernetes will go about trying to achieve that state, right? But that doesn't mean it's only declarative. Uh, it has an imperative API, right? The API allows you to write your own introspective services or controllers atop of it, right? So you could write a service that runs on Kubernetes that talks back to Kubernetes that can control and act and request more resources. Right? Very similar to how a Yarn application works. So what are the core concepts that you'll need to understand in Kubernetes in order for you to bridge the gap across the two services, right? Well, fundamentally there's pods, okay? Uh, pods are the atom of scheduling and are a group of containers that are scheduled onto the same host. You might construe this as co-scheduling, but by the strict definition it's not, right? <clears throat> pods facilitate data sharing and communication between containers within a pod, so they have a shared mount point, uh, shared network namespace, IP and port space. Uh, it's a higher order abstraction than the containers itself, and they, they serve as the foundation for your composable microservices. The next core concept is controllers, right? Eventual consistency is maintained by separate controllers. Each controller's purpose is to rectify the discrepancy between the declared state of a primitive with the current state of the system, right? So if I say a replica of two, what happens is a user would submit a YAML or JSON file. That YAML or JSON file would then be turned into a data structure. That data structure would be written to etcd. There's independently, there is a controller, right? The controller would monitor a certain registry location, as they call it, in etcd. As soon as there was a change in that, the controller would start up a separate data structure or a separate object, right? That object would then read in that state information, and then it would read in the state of the system, right? If the system state does not match the state that it read in, then it would spin more pods, it would basically, it would, it would submit more pods. Then the scheduler would pick up and notice that those pods existed and then schedule them out to the nodes. All make sense, clear as mud? So it's like a microservice engine for microservices. The second, the third core concept is services. Uh, a service provides a single stable name and address for a set of pods. They typically act as a load balance proxy endpoint or a nod colliding NAT, right? <clears throat> Cloud-based implementations have native support for creating external load balancers, uh, and it provides a construct which is used to look up name and, <clears throat> and link pods through injection of an IP address. So what happens when you create a service, you're basically creating a non-routable address to the external world, right? Uh, that routable address is, is mucked on the IP tables of every node in the machine, or in that, in that Kubernetes cluster, right? Because you muck the IP tables, any pod that lands in that machine has a route to that muck, right? <clears throat> so what does it look like, right? If I'm a client and I'm basically creating a replication controller of three with a service, Right. you will have a proxy. That proxy allows you to route to those three different backends, and they will be load balanced. Does that make sense? So if I go back here, replica of, well, replica of three in this case, right? And then you'll have an entry point, and then anybody who wants to access that individual service can then access it through the proxy. That is key to understanding how to link across the two. Final core concept is labels. It doesn't really apply as much, but we'll go through it anyways. Um, labels are key value pairs associated with pods or nodes, uh, similar to attributes in Mesos. Other people had other things they called in other systems. Right? Uh, labels enable operators to map their own structures onto objects in a loosely coupled fashion. It's also very useful for doing rolling upgrades inside of Kubernetes. So what are some of the use cases, right? If I were to do a characterization of, of different types of workloads, where would Kubernetes fit in the whole ecosystem, right? If 
I'm managing my data center, I'm going to have users. Users want to be able to have certain solutions that are tailored for their needs, right? Well, you have your traditional batch, which could be Kronos or other systems, right? You have your directed acyclic batch engines, which are typically things like um, MapReduce or Spark, but they're essentially batch. Uh, then you have your stream processing engines like Storm. Spark also has a stream processing engine too as well. Then you have things like Marathon, which kind of have some of the facilities of PaaS, but not all of the facilities of PaaS. Then you have Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes fits in sort of as an engine for a PaaS, right? And also has like this mini batch area over to the left. So you can do very simple one-off jobs too as well. And Mesos, of course, fits below them all, right? Mesos is a meta scheduler. It allows you to plug in any vertical atop of it that fits into a certain characterization within that stream. The only one characterization that it won't fit into is sort of that high performance batch area or supercomputing type of space, right? So what are the use cases? Well, one primary use case is <coughs> container orchestration for cloud native applications. That's like the de facto thing that people use it for. Uh, they also use it as an engine for building fully featured PaaS systems on top of them, right? A good example of this is OpenShift. Uh, OpenShift adds the developer and operational centric tools on top of Kubernetes to enable rapid application development, easy deployment of scaling, and long-term lifecycle maintenance of small and large-term team applications. So what's the status of Kubernetes, right? So 1.0, Plus now exists uh, and is for availability for GCE, Atomic, or your favorite distribution. Uh, there is a Mesos framework in the main repository and is supported. Talk to the folks at Mesosphere if you're interested. Um, <clears throat> Kates has formally been given to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which means that it's no longer owned directly by Google Cloud. Uh, it also has a separate organizational structure now called Kubernetes on GitHub. So, it's good to know where in the life cycle certain projects live and how the communities are being formed. Okay, that's great. Now, how does Kubernetes and Mesos kind of live together? So let's talk about Mesos and the modern data center, right? So what are some of the characteristics of the modern data center? Well, you have a shared infrastructure, right? <clears throat> Versus silos that you had in the past. Uh, it has to be multi-tenant. You have to have multiple elastic workloads. I don't think people truly understand how important that is, right? Uh, where you have analytics, streaming, and pass, not just one or the other, right? And my joke around analytics and streaming is that uh, apparently Gartner has removed big data from their nomenclature. Big data no longer exists. So now it's analytics and streaming. PaaS nowadays doesn't mean PaaS what it used to be, right? Now PaaS is kind of composable microservices, right? Uh, you need to have quality of service tiers. You need to have a base layer of services that are, enable you to never go down, right? If, that, if those base core services ever go down, then, you know, why are you using this technology? Uh, then there also needs to be the notion of fairness and quota, right? Which are both exist now in exists now or will exist in some way in, inside of uh, Mesos, right? But we can get into fine minutia if we want to around quota. Uh, nowadays, the modern data center doesn't just have a flat L3 network, right? There are many networks. Some are software defined, some are not, right? <clears throat> and there's also layers and layers of security, right? Um, especially if you're doing multiple independent subclusters within one larger cluster. So if I take that statement and I give it an operational perspective, right, what does this kind of mean for a lot of folks, right? Not all folks. So Netflix created a great system architecture uh, around sort of how to do a recommendations engine, right? Uh, if you break it down, there are three separate sections, right? One of those sections was offline. Uh, offline was doing a lot of batch processing, where you're doing machine learning algorithms, uh, modeling, data analysis, uh, ETL, et cetera. Then there's nearline, which is you're doing a lot of stream processing, and that's where your traditional services live, like databases, right? Um, 
Then you have your online, which is a lot of your cloud native, uh, as well as your PaaS uh, type of applications, your UI clients, your web framework, digital uh, event dispatching. So from a stack perspective, um, it kind of looks like this. Right? Very similar to the, the previous diagram that I showed, but it just kind of lumps it together. And again, the ongoing joke is analytics plus streaming is just big data. So crossing the streams. What happens when I create a service on Kubernetes and want to use it in Mesos? What happens if I want to use a framework from Mesos inside of Kubernetes? Right? Well, warning, there be dragons here, right? Little did I know when I first started doing this how much pain I would get myself into, right? So when I was first doing this, I, I went into it with a notion of, 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 you know, this should be easy. Uh, one thing I walked away with is that there are many ways to do this, right? And uh, instead of you giving you a prescriptive methodology for doing this, I have a set of rules that I followed and I wrote them down, right? So step one, devise a plan, right? Draw out your core services of your data center, for the love of God. <laughs> Determine your external visibility, right? What visibility do you want each service to have to the other services? Right? Uh, are you gonna have some air gapping? Uh, plan your resolution, what's your ingress and egress across your different services? <clears throat> what's your network accessibility to your other frameworks? A lot of times when you see reference examples, all the examples are very flat, right? They don't have a complicated multimodal infrastructure. What happens if I work for a very large company who has multiple BUs and each BU wants to set up a different vertical for their thing but have one shared infrastructure? You want to be able to set up quality of service domains for those each individual BU. Otherwise, you're gonna get midnight calls, right? <clears throat> Um, try not to rely too much on DNS. DNS in the past was your trusty friend and colleague. Uh, sometimes it can be, you know, the source of much frustration. Um, prefer service discovery services, if at all possible, or well-defined VIPs for primary core services. You can rely on DNS. I'm not saying don't. I'm just saying beware of what this can entail, right? <clears throat> Plan your overlay networks, right? Where will your overlay networks exist? Will your IPs collide, right? Because um, if your IPs do collide, you'll have IP stealing. That's what I ran into. And I didn't run into it on purpose. Uh, basically what happened is another person set up another cluster and stole my IP for my main central CI system, right? And then I tried to SSH in my system and now it was where the hell am I, right? <laughs> I'm on a completely different box because someone has set up a series of, of VXLANs um, and they had bridges to support the initial creation of those VXLANs, right? All in the same IP address space. Uh, try to separate your networks to maintain some level of quality of service, right? It will be awesome. Your plan will be amazing. It'll be unicorns, rainbows. Uh, you'll say to yourself, this is gonna be great, right? So what happens when I wanna expose a service in Kubernetes? There are two primary methods to expose that service in Kubernetes. If you're on a cloud provider, they have a load balancer construct that you can create. Uh, it has several parameters you can specify. Uh, on cloud providers which support external load balancers, setting the type field to load balancer will provision a load balancer for your service. Right. On non-cloud-based services, you can specify node port. And they have support going in soon for the equivalent of what other people call edge routers, very similar. Uh, the Kubernetes master will allocate a port from a flag configured range, right, some ephemeral port number. Uh, and each node will proxy that port, <clears throat> the same port number on every node onto your service, right? Now there, there is a new, some people might cringe at that a little bit, but that's what exists right now. There is a proposal for a different methodology. Plan for constraints, right? Are you dealing with any legacy systems that require DNS, right? Many legacy systems depend upon DNS for better or worse, right? 
plan your namespacing and namespace resolution where possible. Are you going to use net groups or what do you want to do, right? Are you going to have engineering, prod, are you going to based upon multiple modalities, right? <clears throat> In a multi-tenant environment, uh, you could have 10 copies of the same service. You could have hundreds or thousands of copies of the same service. So what happens if your other services that people have created want to be able to connect to something? Well, you need something to segregate it, usually namespaces. Right? So in Kubernetes, it's another construct that allows you to be able to segregate your resolution or discovery service for your individual pods. But that doesn't give you visibility external to it, so you have to create your own type of namespacing. Right? Uh, also, reverse DNS, if some services require reverse DNS, um, I highly recommend trying to disable that in this new type of environment because it often results in a NAT failure. Right? What are some other constraints? Do you want to set up your own VLANs to have QoS across your networks? Are you going to deal with overlay networking? Now, there's always this new kind of performance engineers always look at VXLANs or overlay networks with a, with a cringe, right? Because they know the performance drop that exists across overlay networks. But overlay networks have hardware acceleration. That hardware acceleration is getting faster and cheaper. Uh, in the last months when I first looked at it was back in April. Um, VXLAN offload cards from Intel, I believe, cost $1,500. Now they're $500. Uh, and I hear tell of going into chipsets. So I think over time you're going to see the acceleration it's, probably, it's primarily driven by cloud providers, right? Because they can turn any very expensive things into a commodity in no time. So over time, I, I see this going down. Right? I see overlay networks eventually increasing, having hardware acceleration to increase their performance. Right? Plan for collision avoidance or IP stealing. That was the pain that I ran into. Determine if, whether or not you want to have VIPs and whether or not you're going to load balance those VIPs. Right. Step two, create a test experiment. I highly recommend considering clusters and testing your clusters to be ephemeral. Right. Uh, have a sandbox where you can play with services and break things in an environment that's not going to break somebody else. One of the things that I had come into was that somebody else broke my cluster. Right. Just trying to deal with setting up their own private clusters, they broke my cluster. Totally unrelated, right? Uh, <clears throat> test setting up uh, separate networks for different services. Uh, like I mentioned before, consider clusters to be ephemeral. It actually makes your life easier. Don't think of one PaaS, think of many PaaS is, is, right? So you can have many PaaS available to you in your core infrastructure, right? That was the same idea that I was mentioning with having many verticals within an organization. Uh, try reaching across networks, see what happens. Set up different load balancing services, pick your favorite, HA proxy, Nginx, whatever you desire. Uh, determine if VIPs make sense for you, it doesn't really scale. You know, so if you're a large organization with hundreds of thousands of nodes, that's not gonna work for you. Um, step three. Burn your original plan. <laughs> if you didn't learn something from your experimentation, you were doing it wrong, right? One thing I realize is I am not a network engineer. I, I am a distributed system software engineer, right? And I thought I knew networks pretty well. Turns out in this modern day of networking, I don't really know networks as nearly as much as I used to, right? I'm only half joking. Uh, you will likely run into issues you never knew existed. Consult your local network operator. But most of all, enjoy the journey. Uh, it may get a little messy, uh, but it'll definitely be worth it. Um, once you're able to bridge the gap across your services and maintain quality of service, um, it, it will be an enjoyable, enjoyable experience for a lot of your customers or clients, which could be internal services or whatnot. And thank you. Um, we got some time for questions. Yep. Sure. 
if you're dealing with latency sensitive applications? Um, no, uh, not right now. I <clears throat> define latency sensitive applications though too. What VIPs are you using? Or like what, what services, what um, load balancer are you using? Both. No, I don't necessarily have a recommendation. Uh, again, I'm not, a, I'm not a network operator. What, what I've learned is there are many ways to, to interlink the two systems and we do, we had noticed some, we had done some profiling across the two and um, nothing in depth or sophisticated. At this point, yes. What are you using for virtual service discovery? It depends on the service. So, some some technologies use their own rally pointing, right? Etcd is a good example. Right? So, for individual ones, you could do that. Uh, you can, spec you can create your own rally pointing if you wanted to, which is what other people are doing. They're doing that in Kubernetes, right? So that's the, the typical thing I see, the typical pattern. Right? Yes? Uh, I would defer to OpenShift for doing sort of continuous integration, right? So. That reference that I made to my CI system was not necessarily for this. Another person had bashed my CI system uh, by setting up their own separate cluster, right? So I, I had a separate CI environment, but there are many PASs uh, which do sort of continuous integration or per build commits, right? Per build commit deploys, and then they s use the canary pattern on Kubernetes to auto roll out, right? You can specify the parameters that you'd like. So that's kind of, that's a feature of Kubernetes that many PASs build the top of it, right? So they have auto monitoring of your Git repository on a change you Git repository. You can specify parameters whether or not you want that to be auto rolled out or not, right? That's, that's almost like a PAS-like feature though. Yes? Well, you want to use one service in one area and another service in the other way. Uh, using the right tool for the right job. What makes the most sense for you, right? So it depends entirely upon your deployment topology, right? Some folks might want to have a declarative microservice engine because that works for them, right? But they want to use some of those facilities across other frameworks, right? So you're always going to have to interoperate, right? Just like I mentioned in the previous in the very beginning, there, there are many different cluster management systems that exist, right? And they all had to figure out a way to interoperate in order for you to deal with solving the problem, right? In that case, it was federated computing, right? Any other questions? No? Well, thank you very much.